You know, it's fascinating every Sunday how things just come together. And this morning, I was just blessed by the rich words. Like, I thought, what word would stand out for me of all these words we've been using to praise our Abba? It's overwhelming, and it doesn't end. That's very exciting. And it's a little bit of a switch for the sermon. The sermon today is very basic. It's a real basic sermon. I am very definitely preaching it to myself, because I'm slow to hear, obviously. But I also believe this is for someone or some ones of you. And this particular sermon fits very nicely with Jonathan's stellar sermon last week on how we respond to God, and with the mini-series Barry is doing, also going to be stellar, Bear, on how to live with hope, basically how to walk in the Spirit in these troubling times. So I think it fits. And the message for today is this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. This proverb has come up a lot in the prayer group and in some of the life groups. And when we say this particular proverb, we often add verse 6, which is, in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. And I think that that fits with what Barry's going to be doing in part in, this, in, this service, in his sermon series. Saying Proverbs 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, is really easy to say, and it's really easy to say to somebody else. (laughs) But what I have found, it's far more difficult to actually live it. And to look at how that works out, I want to look at God's call to Moses in the burning bush, and part of his and Israelites' response, and what that trust walk looks like, and how it develops. And I think... It'll help all of us also. You'll have to spend the time yourself reflecting on how it fits for you. But before we get into that, I want to look at just some background facts. And even background facts astonish me with what they say about the God we sang about this morning. It astonishes me how God orchestrates things and and it shows why it's wise and best to trust in Him and not ourselves. The passage we're going to be looking at starts in Exodus 3, but Exodus 1 starts off by reminding us that the Israelites ended up in Egypt to escape the famine. Remember the story of Joseph? And when they went there, they went there with 70 to 75 people. That was Jacob who went with his sons. Jacob was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. In Genesis 12, we read that God called Abraham to his own, and God told Abraham that he'd make him, that he would have as many descendants as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. Then in Genesis 15, God also told Abraham that these descendants would end up enslaved for 400 years, and then they would come back to this promised land, but not until the sins of the Amorites was full. Well, to me, if you're making somebody a nice promise, like you're going to have a lot of kids, you don't then want to hear, but they're going to be in slavery, right? And he says, that's going to happen until the sins of the Amorites are full. And that already takes Proverbs 3, into verse 5, into account, because it's something about God doing something in his timing. And then if we move to Exodus, in Exodus 1, verse 7, we read that Israel was very fruitful and multiplied greatly, and the land was filled with them. In fact, God blessed them so much that the Egyptians were scared of them, and they began oppressing them. And then in Exodus 1, verse 12, we read that they were oppressed, and the more they were oppressed, remember the next part? The more they multiplied. Like, God uses oppression. And the people we're going to be looking at today they were witnessing a fulfillment of the prophecy to Abraham to make them a great nation. They were witnessing, they were living out the prophecy of being enslaved, and they were going to see in part the promise of God to bring them to the promised land. Like, that's just the background. And then we look at Moses. Now you need a background on Moses. So, and before we look at the call via the fiery bush, note some things that have happened in Moses' life so far. We talk about hindsight being 2020. I don't believe that at all. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to think 2020. Good need. Goodness, that's nothing. Moses' life so far is fascinating and awe inspiring. And it's also very humbling to see God's hand. And I encourage you to look at your own life and see that. We often think, or maybe I should speak for myself, I often think and act like I know what's best, out of my wisdom. And I often lean on my own understanding. But when, as Oswald Chambers says, when I take my understanding off the throne 
and I look at what God is doing, it's overwhelming. So let's look at Moses. Moses gets to live. You know that in itself is a miracle. His mom was supposed to have drowned him, but instead she makes a little basket and lets him float down the river. Now, Pharaoh's daughter, there's a lot of people in Egypt. Pharaoh's daughter happens to need a bath at just that time. Do you think that's coincidence? And then just about that time, Moses starts crying. Hmm, was that coincidence? And Pharaoh's daughter hear it, hears it, and Moses is providentially rescued, and then she, in her wisdom, gives him the name Moses, because that means drawn out. I mean, that's so cute, like he was drawn, I'm going to call him Moses. But for Moses, that's a huge symbol. He was drawn out of the water. But as Israel is following him, as they are drawn out of Egypt, they are following the drawn out man. Like, I mean, how can God set it up any better? Blah. And then Moses' mom gets paid to nurse him, how ironic. A slave woman gets money to nurse her own son. And then the one, the person who's going to rescue Israel from Egypt is raised by Pharaoh's daughter in Pharaoh's court. So that means Moses, not like any of his countrymen, Moses gets good, nutritious food. He gets all kinds of skills, training, and education that is certainly going to help him in leading Israel out of Egypt. And what I think is even cooler than that, I think it helped him write scripture. Huh. <laughs> Genocide was commanded by Pharaoh, and yet he, the enemy of Israel, the one who is seen as a god, ends up training Moses, ends up training the guy who's ultimately going to overthrow him, and Pharaoh has to foot the bill. <laughs> I've got Dutch roots, I think that's a good deal. So Moses had about 40 years of his good life, and then, as you know, he sees an Egyptian fighting with the Hebrew, he kills the Hebrew, I mean, he kills the Egyptian and has to flee for his life. And it's amazing, again, how even a fight that leads to a death can be used by God. Moses flees to the desert, where he ends up meeting his future wife, who just happened to be the daughter of a believer, a priest, Jethro. And then Moses works as a shepherd for 40 years, 40 years is a long time to think about things, to meditate on what has happened, to learn some vital shepherding skills, which along with his training in Egypt is gonna help him with his people Israel. Would Moses have known any of that? I'm not sure. Look back at your own history. See if you can see it. So now let's look at our passage. So if we could have this slide. Now Moses was tending the flock of, his, of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flood flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Was it a coincidence that he ended up there? There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, oh, we'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now Moses is 80. This is, gives me hope as a senior citizen. Moses was 80. He has never likely heard from God this way. For the first 80 years of his life, when he hears God speak to him, he realizes that he is seen, that he is known by name, you guys. And he knows that God is holy, that this is the God of his dad, as, as well as his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can you imagine hearing that at that phase in your life? But God tells him more, and God tells him some stuff about himself. And this stuff is vital, because he's going to be asking something big of Moses, and this is the one whom, in whom Moses will have to put his trust if he takes on the challenge. So let's read the next section. I think I bold. Can you see that the, some letters are bold? Okay. Just because that points out what God has done. The Lord said, I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their sufferings. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. 
And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This passage has given me a lot of trouble and many, many questions over the past because I don't understand why God has let them suffer. You say, now I heard your cry? Like, what about all those other 400 years? But that's not what God is addressing. God now further identifies himself with what Moses and what we need to know, that he is a God who does see, who hears, and is concerned, and is doing something in his own time and in his own wisdom. Lean not on your understanding or your wisdom. God has come now to bring them out of slavery, so the sins of the Amorites must be full. And God acknowledges clearly that there's a problem, and he gives a solution, which is good. But the solution has a bit of a catch, so to speak. God says to Moses, I'm very concerned. And now, Moses, you, go do something. And that changes things a bit. It's great having God identify himself, but now he's asking Moses, us, to act from that knowledge, to trust that. But Moses, as we know, isn't so sure. And as we read on, it's beautiful to watch how God leads him into learning to trust and retrust again. So now Moses says to God, but, there's a lot of buts in this section, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Well, that's a fair question. Egypt has been a superpower for 3,000 years. Can you imagine at 80, somebody saying to you, God saying to you, okay, I, want, I, don't, I can't pick on anyone because I don't want to insult with age. Pick on Norm. Saying to Norm, I want you to go against Putin. I want you to go against China. That's, that's what he's saying to Moses. And Moses knows this superpower. He knows them. And now God comes to him, God who has not likely spoken to him before, and says, now you go. So saying, well, who am I to go against the world power makes sense. And God's answer is fascinating. He does not remind Moses of everything he's done for him so far. He doesn't itemize his skill level. He doesn't offer him counseling or healing for his past. What he tells Moses is the only thing he needs to know. God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you've brought the people out of Egypt. You will worship me, God, on this mountain. So the answer to the question that we ask God, that Moses asks God, who am I, lies in who God is. Ultimately, it's not about God. I mean, sorry, it's not about Moses and his identity or ours. It's Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord and don't lean on your own understanding. And this sign that God gives Moses here already requires trust because it's a future sign. It's not immediate. And unconvinced, Moses says... Well, suppose I go to the Israelites, who, by the way, have not heard from you for a while and are in cruel slavery, and I say to them, yeah, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what's his name? What should I tell him? And again, the, ident the answer lies in God's identity. It's not about who Moses is or what he brings or doesn't bring to the table. God said to Moses, and we know this passage really well, I am who I am. And that's what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to the Moses, say to the Israelites, the God, the Lord, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. And what's fascinating in here is I am who I am, and I will be with you. Moses will experience that and will learn and relearn to trust. God is the great I am, but what floor, floors me is that other part, I am with you. That's the part that completes his name. You can't have God without being with you. God, I am, like they're, they're just like that. And that's what Moses has to experience and will experience. God's name, God's I am, expresses his desire to have the fullest trust of his people. I am who will be with you. I am, trust me. And as we know, Israel, they've been in slavery for 400 years, will hear God introduced this way. Because God says to Moses, so go talk to the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the I am, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me 
and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to bring you out of your misery into a land of milk and honey. Yeah, you have been in slavery. Yes, you have suffered. But Proverbs 3, verse 5, know that something bigger is going on, and trust me. And God continues to lay out his plan. Moses, this is what's going to happen. The elders will listen to you. And this is what Barry and Nancy want to have happen, that the elders listen to them. But this is for Moses now. The elders will listen to you, but Pharaoh will not. What a creepy message. But then God says, So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform amongst them. And after that, he will let you go. Elders will listen. Pharaoh won't. Now, if God has just told you to go up against the most powerful man and nation in the world and then tells you, but he's not going to listen to you, that you, that wouldn't really instill a whole lot of confidence. But again, Proverbs 3, verse 5, God says, trust me, I'm going to use Pharaoh's refusal to stretch out my hand and I'm going to perform wonders. And then there's even more. And then you, my chosen ones, who are now penniless and slaves in Egypt, you're going to leave with silver and gold and clothes without lifting a finger. Notice what he says in verse 21. I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people, so they will not leave empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. It takes care of the mama's hearts. And you will plunder Egypts and the Egyptians. I mean, this is phenomenal. God has told them everything that's going to happen and that they're going to be leaving wealthy. But Moses says, what if they don't listen? God has already addressed that. And yet with great patience, he hears this objection. And in his mercy, he gives Moses three immediate signs to build his and the elders' faith. He gives him a staff that's going to turn into a snake and back into a staff again. Healthy flesh turned to leprosy and healthy flesh again, and water to blood. And those signs seem to convince Moses, because he doesn't argue the signs, but look at what he does in verse 10. He leans on his own understanding, and he says, but, Lord, I don't talk so good. He's already talked to God about this, but he says, I have never been eloquent in speech, like it hasn't helped since I talked to you. I'm slow of speech, slow of speech, and God answers patiently again, I'm getting ready to smuck the little guy. But God says to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will speak, and I will teach you what to, dis what to say. God's answer is, I made you the, ma the way I made you and the way I need you to be. So now go, something bigger than you is happening. Trust in me. I will speak. I will teach you what to say. And God in his mercy has already commissioned Aaron. The boys haven't seen each other for 40 years. And Aaron's already on his way. He already knows how to speak well. God set all that up. And at this point... A bit of a miracle happens because Moses quits arguing and begins his trust walk and goes equipped by God to walk out the call on his life and challenge a world power. But you know, it's almost humorous. At the ripe old age of 80, he goes up against the mightiest man alive with a stick. That's a good look. But God commissions. The ground Moses was standing on became holy because of God's presence. The stick in his hand becomes the staff of God. Moses, a murderer and a fugitive, becomes the man of God because of man God commissioned him and leads him out of Israel. So God calls, he commissions, and he arms. The God is the great I am, the one who goes with his children. And then the focus, as Moses goes, goes from the desert to Egypt, where Moses and Aaron deal with the Israelites and Pharaoh. Moses has a huge call on his life, a very big task. And the Israelites don't have that same kind of call. They, like most of us, are primarily called to follow. But following requires a great deal of trust and living out of Proverbs 3, verse 5. In Exodus 4, we see that Moses and Aaron meet the Israelite elders and they performed all the signs that Moses gave and they believed. So the elders have been in slavery. They've been working hard. They come together. 
to hear Moses and Aaron, and then Moses and Aaron say, our God is concerned about you. He's seen your misery. And the elders believed, and the response was the right response. They bowed down and worshipped. And I think when you hear, you've, you're in slavery and it's cruel, when you hear God cares, you expect that things are going to get better. Finally, it's going to get better. And then it gets worse. They have to make the same amount of bricks without their own straw. And the battle, the spiritual battle is gone, is on, and God begins to show his outstretched arm. But the people and Moses lean on their own understanding, and they cannot see it. In 521, they say to Moses, you have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials. And Moses turns to God and says, you have not, I've only brought trouble of, on us, and you have not rescued us at all. In their own understanding, that's what they say. And then our amazing, patient God says, well, now you're going to see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. This is my timing. Now, for me, as an impatient person, now means now. But this now takes a while and is a process. God addresses Moses' concern, and I want you to notice what he says. I didn't write out all the actual passage, but most just the verbs. This is what God says in 6 verse 1. So if we could have a slide. He says, and notice the repetition of I am the Lord, the I am. Now you will see what I, the great I am, am about to do to Pharaoh. I am the Lord. I appear to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai. They didn't know me as Yahweh, Yahweh, but you do. I also established a covenant. I heard their groaning. I have remembered my covenant. I am the Lord. I will bring them out. I will free you. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people. I will be your God, and then you will know that I am the Lord. I will bring you out. I will give you the land I swore with uplifted hand to give you. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. This is God. This is the I am. And these are only some of his credentials. This is the God who so desires the trust and love of his people. This is a God who goes all out. This is the God they just worshipped. And yet the next verse is one of the saddest verses because Moses reports all this to the Israelites, not with a nice PowerPoint. But they didn't listen to him because of their discouragement and hard labor. And I so get that. When you are discouraged, when you're in hard labor, when stuff is just too much, you can no longer hear. You go deaf to the things of God. But it also is an example of leaning on our own understanding, not remembering his word, not remembering his promises. And what's God's response to that? He still doesn't schmuck them. He moves ahead. The next slide. Then the Lord said to Moses, go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of this country. But, said Moses, the Israelites didn't listen to me. I still have these lips. How is Pharaoh going to listen to me? And God's answer is not quite what Moses wanted to hear. There's no reassurance. God says, no, he's not going to listen to you. And you know what? That's fantastic. Because then then I will lay my hand on Egypt and with mighty acts of judgment I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. And I think the next verse must be God's favorite verse in the whole Bible. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded. God is who he is and it's out of love and compassion he shows us who he is we know the rest of the story the plagues the Passover the crossing of the Red Sea the wandering through the desert and it's really fascinating to read through Exodus and see how Moses and the Israelites respond and how Proverbs 3 verse 5 works out in their lives their trustometer if you want to call it that fluctuates greatly but this is the important part God remains faithful and trustworthy God called and commissioned and gifted Moses for a task. God called, commissioned, and gifted Israel for their task as his chosen people. He gave them a good leader. He gave them wealth, so they left Egypt wealthy. He went ahead of them and behind them in the desert. He gave them miraculously food and water and clothing that didn't wear out. He gave them the law so they would know how to worship him. And yet, with all that, their trust wavered and they regularly leaned on their own understanding. But God remained faithful. 
And God did bring them back to the promised land as he promised more than 400 years earlier. That's a process that involves his people and that requires them to trust in the Lord. That goal would be reached not just for Israel, but for us, for the world, and for God's glory. So what's the call to us? You'll never guess. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. God has made himself known to you in your life. He's made himself known to you throughout your life in many little ways. You probably can't see all of it. Ask others. Someone asked me that once during a wretched time of my life, can't you see the hand of God? And I said, no, I can't. I have repented of that because I see God now so much more than I could. Spend time and reflect on, he has, on how he has shown himself to you. Get to know him better through his word. It's right there. He, he gave all those words to the Israelites and they couldn't hear it. He's given them to us through fellowship, through using the spiritual disciplines like worship and prayer. Caroline Leaf says, position yourselves to let the Holy Spirit <clears throat> deposit truth and direction in your spirit. Position yourself. Listen to him. Proverbs 3 verse 5 is not just for tough times. It's easy in tough times. Oh, I've got to trust him. But the 24-7, the little things, the daily things. I found myself under a big cloud when I was struggling with this sermon because of stuff that's happening in my family. And, and I felt the question regularly, but are you trusting me? Yeah, but... And I gave God quite a few healthy, helpful suggestions. <laughs> but that's not the trust, right? And, but he's a, like, look at how he deals with his people. He, he deals with them. He listens to them. He talks to them. Deal with him about it. And talk to your, your neighbors and your friends. This is the great I am. This is the one who is faithful, who is with us. The great I am came in Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. And you know what? I will never leave you or forsake you. Trust in me with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. That's the message for today.